Hey everyone, and welcome to this week's DeFi Pulse bi-weekly report by Nexus Mutual. Thrilled to have you all with us today. We've got an exciting lineup on the agenda. Brave new DeFi is here joining us from the Nexus Mutual main account to share the latest insights in DeFi covering everything from yields to risk trends shaping the space. Foundation updates from Hugh will give us a deeper look into our new partnership with Native and what it means for the mutual. Hugh will also share the latest updates from engineering, BD, and the foundation teams. I will be unveiling our new community dashboard on Doom, diving into how it amplifies transparency at Nexus Mutual. And of course, stick around for your POAP at the end. Let's dive in. Brave, what's new in DeFi? Thanks, Sam. Yeah, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, normally, I start off with an overview of the markets before diving into the yield landscape, but I think it's safe to say that everybody on this call knows the major catalyst that's driving uh, the uptick in the market and the massive uh, weekly green candle that we've seen on the majors. Uh, we went from a crab market to kind of a, a really white hot market in a matter of two weeks after the US election results came out. So that bullish trend is reflected across most of the major derivative exchanges as leverage traders are paying um, shorts between 22% and 70% APY to go long on ETH. Uh, for the last several months, funding rates have hovered between 10% APY to 15% to go long on ETH. So now we're seeing rates spike as traders increase their appetite for leverage. That's also what's driving uh, the increase in yields on major lending markets in DeFi as well. So it looks like we're moving into the next phase of the market cycle, which some have argued is the end of the excitement phase or the beginning of the euphoria phase. If you're not familiar with that, you can look up on Google, like the Wall Street cheat sheet for the psychology of a market cycle. Um, but right now we're kind of heading up the curve toward the, uh, the top of the market. Um, and it's kind of up for debate which section that we're in, but, uh, but yeah, definitely the market is taking off and yields are kind of reflecting that. So as the market continues to heat up, just keep in mind a few things. Um, if you're trading, just remember to take profit periodically. Uh, it's kind of from my own perspective after being around for a couple of cycles. Be sure that you can pay your bills in real life. Uh, that's really, really important. Be careful with leverage. It's really tempting to deposit ETH on Aave, borrow stables, and then buy more ETH. But if the market goes down and you get liquidated, you're going to lose months or years of hard work and have little left to show for it. So be careful with leverage and don't use so much that you worry about leaving your computer for hours at a time. You don't want to be chained to your computer for an entire market cycle. Uh, be safe out there when you're looking at yields. So if you see really high APYs, kind of be suspicious and do a little research. Just remember that a thousand percent APY on zero dollars is still zero dollars. So if something sounds too good to be true, be suspicious, do your own research instead of just taping into something. Uh, don't trade more than you can afford to lose. And if you're seeing people tweeting about things on Twitter, also be suspicious. Um, that's a common thing that you'll see is people recommending this or that, but a lot of times they're just trying to promote their own bags. Um, so. Just be really careful where you get your information up from what you're looking at and kind of, you know, what you're seeing as far as APYs. Uh, in a bull market, exploits tend to typically ramp up because the incentive for black hats is much higher as the prices of assets go up. So buy covers that suit your need to protect yourself against hacks and exploits. Um, there's just a greater chance that people are going to be finding vulnerabilities as the value of the TVL and these protocols ramps up. So. Don't let a hack ruin the bull market for you. I mean, the easiest way to protect against getting hacked or suffering you know, from a loss to an exploit is just to buy cover. So at Nexus Mutual, we have lots and lots of options. But let's talk a little bit about the yield landscape in DeFi right now. Uh, I have been looking at vaults FYI for the benchmark rates. So I used to manually calculate the on-chain base rate that I put in my newsletter, but vaults FYI has started doing this for me. Uh, anybody can check on those benchmark yields for USD and ETH on their site. They use the average across the major lending markets to calculate that. 
So this week, the USD benchmark rate has climbed to 6.45% APY, which is a little more than 2% um, lower than the Sky Savings rate on USDS through Sky Protocol. Uh, the Sky Savings rate recently went up to 8.5%, and the Dai Savings rate recently went up to 7.5%. So that usually sets some of the floors for lending as people arbitrage that rate back and forth. So I think we can expect to see lending rates rise a little bit more to, to match those rates. Um, the benchmark rate for USD, though, is also over 2% higher than current U.S. Treasury yields. So the wider that spread is between U.S. Treasury yields and on-chain yields, the more likely we'll see greater inflows coming on-chain into DeFi. The benchmark rate for ETH is at 3.17%, which is in line with the average yield available across ETH liquid staking tokens. There's quite a few yield opportunities in DeFi right now where you can earn far greater than the benchmark rate for both ETH and USD. I'll highlight some of those examples in a bit. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the role of leverage in a bull market. I've had some people ask me questions about this, and I've talked back and forth with a few people on Twitter recently about lending yields on Aave. So somebody had asked why the interest rates on the Arbitrum Aave V3 market were so much higher than other Aave markets. Um, at one given time, and why the interest rates have jumped and, you know, why they're not being arbitraged back to some baseline. Um, but if you, you know, look at those markets, they do get arbitraged over time. So because I've seen this come up a few times, I thought I'd just talk about this before talking more about yield strategies, since some of those include protocols that use leverage. So when the market takes off, people use lending markets to leverage their crypto assets for a variety of reasons. Some people want to maintain their exposure to ETH and other assets without selling. So they borrow stables against their collateral to pay you know, expenses in real life. Um, some people want to create a leveraged long position by depositing ETH, borrowing stables, buying more ETH, depositing it as collateral and repeating the process. Uh, this is like a, a looping leverage strategy. Um, there are other protocols that automate that process, like Summerfy, Katango, Instadap Lite. Um, but with leverage, that's going to uh, introduce greater risk in your position as well. Um, and then there are people that are farming on yield-bearing assets like USDE, SUSDE, SUSDS. Um, and what they're trying to do is increase their returns by using a looping strategy, kind of like I described with ETH they can amplify the amount of yield they're earning by just borrowing and kind of looping um, looping up their, their collateral so they can borrow more and then earn more yield and then just use that yield to pay off the interest rate on their borrowed assets. Uh, Aave V3 has you know, emo with like-kind assets, so people can get really high efficiency in lending. Uh, same with things on like Morpho and Fluid. They have markets with higher loan to value thresholds for stable to stable borrowing as well. So all of this demand, this appetite for leverage on ETH and the greater demand for stable coin assets and yield bearing assets, that drives those interest rates for borrowers and lenders on these markets. But they always end up arbitrage back. So if you actually look on Aave or even if you look on Vaults FYI, you can see like the average over a month's time or a seven day time frame. And they're all averaged down to about the same rate, which over the last month has been between 5 and 6%. So you'll see like a 30-day average yield on certain assets is going to tend to be the same for most stables um, within about 2% on major markets like Aave. So they do get arbitrage back, but it's just where people are borrowing against their assets. So if people have the majority of their assets in Arbitrum, they're going to borrow there. Other people are going to leverage back and forth. Um, but as more people borrow ETH and stablecoin assets, um, those interest rates tend to spike during certain periods. Like during the U.S. election week, USDC on the Aave Ethereum market spiked to like 60% plus APY uh, because people began borrowing enough of the USDC liquidity to drive utilization well above 90%. And the way that Aave's interest rates work is once utilization climbs over 90%, then those rates start to increase. And then that has this push and pull effect on the yield. So as the yields get higher, there's a greater incentive for people to deposit more liquidity to bring back down those rates and to attract more liquidity since there's greater demand for 
um, stable coins and other assets in those markets. So that's really kind of what drives leverage in a market, especially in an upwards market. But when there's more leverage in the market uh, at whole, then this kind of creates more volatility when there's movements in price. So if the price moves down uh, and liquidations are triggered, this can kind of have this uh, effect where there's forced selling, where as assets are being liquidated in mass, it's going to drive down prices because those markets are deleveraging. That also increases risk that there might be a bad debt scenario or something in a market. Um, so when I talk about leverage increasing risk, I'm kind of talking about some of these things is if there is a big flash crash where you know, the price of E drops 30% in, in a few hours. That's going to put stress on a lot of these lending protocols and all of these other protocols that, you know, are kind of automating these looping strategies. So when you're looking at something like forced selling, which again is like mass liquidations, um, I recently saw an example of forced selling uh, on through ExtraFi. So ExtraFi is a yield farming protocol on base, and they have these pairs where you can basically yield farm with leverage on aerodrome so you can earn pretty high yields but you're taking on the risk of leverage uh, there were people that were yield farming with i believe it was ovn and eth um, but there was an ovn either eth or stable coin pair that people were using leverage to farm and the price of ovn dropped from 40 dollars per token to about 10 dollars in a short time frame uh, it's since dropped down to like five or six dollars in the last couple of weeks but what happened during this liquidation event is users on extra finance were leveraged farming with ovn and there was a drop from forty dollars down to 35 that triggered liquidations for some larger users so as it you know there was deleveraging in that market it led to ovn being sold off which further dropped the price and triggered more liquidations and so this kind of led to this cascade of liquidations on extra pie now, there was no bad debt created, but this did have a negative impact on the price of the OVN token since it dropped so much in such a short period of time. So when you're looking at assets that you're yield farming with, you want to make sure there's enough liquidity out there so that if there is a cascade of liquidations, it's not going to have you know, a really catastrophic impact on price like you see here uh, in this example because... You know, that is a scenario where bad debt could be created. Uh, fortunately, though, on extra five, there was no bad debt. Everything worked as intended. It was just unfortunate for those that were farming in that particular market. So leverage plays a really important role in bull markets. Uh, leverage is a useful tool in a lot of the yield strategies you've seen in DeFi. But it also creates a lot more volatility when the price of major assets go down and significant volatility for lower market cap assets. So again, just remember to be careful when you use leverage and ensure you have a solid buffer with your health factor on any lending protocol. But looking at the notable yields, let's talk a little bit about some of the on-chain yields that are available. Uh, I'll go over some on-chain yields, but be sure to do your own research and determine what's suitable for your own risk profile. Uh, I'll start with some ETH-based yields, since I know a lot of people are looking for ways to grow their ETH stack at the moment. Personally, I've been providing liquidity for correlated assets on DEXs to earn yield on my ETH over the last several months. So when you LP ETH and another correlated asset, like a liquid staking token, whether that's our ETH or wrapped ST ETH or some other uh, liquid staking token or a liquid restaking token like uh, wrapped EETH or Easy ETH, you can earn yield without suffering significant and permanent loss. So that's the difference between what you would have earned if you just held the assets in your wallet versus what you earn as a liquidity provider on a DEX. So when you're providing liquidity, you're always buying one asset when the demand for the other is high, vice versa. So if you're LPing a non-correlated pair like ETH and USDC, you're selling ETH when demand for ETH is high and buying USDC when demand for stables is lower relative to ETH. So you can earn trading fees, but you have less exposure to ETH. And if the price of ETH drops and people are selling, you're buying ETH when demand for stables is higher and people are willing to sell their ETH. So that's what's nice about correlated pairs. You can earn trading fees without the downside of significant and permanent loss. So there's a lot of great DEXs out there, but there's a few correlated ETH pairs where the yield has been high in the last day and week. Um, 
the RETH and WETH pair on Uniswap B3 on Ethereum uh, in the 0.05% range. Daily APY for that has been pretty large, so 188%. And the monthly APY, the average over the last month has been 12%. Uh, for the WETH and uh, Puffer ETH pair uh, on Curve, on Ethereum, the daily APY has been 56%, and the monthly APY has been 11%. Uh, for CB ETH and WETH, for the 0.01% pair uh, on PancakeSwap on base, Daily APY there has been 21%, and the average over the last month has been right around the same range, 22%. And easy ETH and WEETH in the 0.01% pair um, on PancakeSwap on base, the daily APY here has been 25%, and the monthly APY has been 26%. So there's been some really, really high yields on correlated to ETH pairs on DEXs, uh, and that's because more people are looking to buy ETH or some of these LSTs or LRTs as the market's picking up. So there's a lot of different options. You can look on DeFi Llama under yields and filter for DEXs and like no one permanent loss. And, you know, you can see some of these pairs pop up. So it's a really great tool. Um, that's what I use to put together a lot of the information. Uh, I've also been LPing some WNXM and WEATH on Uniswap B3 in the 0.3% pool on Ethereum since the yields have been quite high uh, for a while now. That's the major uh, source of liquidity for uh, WNXM at the moment. So since WNXM is effectively correlated to NXM uh, book value in ETH, it's a like-kind asset in ETH terms. The daily APY, since the volumes have been pretty big going through that pool, is uh, 228%, and the monthly APY is 76% over the last 30 days. So that's been very high too. But if you're looking to... Uh, earn yield on your ETH using leverage, you can go two routes. You can use a protocol like Toros Finance, which is built on top of DHedge. Toros has vaults that automatically rebalance, so you don't have to worry about having your position liquidated. Uh, this is a really easy way to get leverage exposure to things. They offer several ETH and BTC leverage vaults on Optimism, Arbitrum, and Base, as well as some vaults that short ETH and BTC as well. I've been really impressed by the Toros team the last year as they've grown their TVL considerably and become a pretty large major protocol on many Ethereum L2s. And you can use a protocol like Arcadia, Contango, or Extra Finance where you can farm leverage yields across major DEXs and lending markets to earn amplified yields. With these strategies, though, you have to ensure your position remains profitable and that the borrowing costs don't exceed the yield you're earning. Um, you can also get liquidated on these protocols. So they require more maintenance than a protocol like Toros Finance. Uh, and of course, you can always deposit on major lending markets like Aave, Morpho, Fluid, or Moonwell to earn between 1% to 7% APY on your ETH or ETH-related assets. So more aggressive yield farming strategies are out there, but you can do your own research on dApps like Arcadia, Katango, Extra Finance, Toros Finance, X, uh, EtherFi's Liquid Vaults, and others. So if you want to earn on ETH, there's countless opportunities right now in DeFi. Um, again, that DeFi Llama yields page is uh, really indispensable as a resource. Uh, but if you're looking to earn yield on your stable coins, there's plenty to do on chain to grow your stable coin holdings. The lending markets are the simplest way to grow your stable coin stack. So USDT lenders on Gearbox have earned an average of 16% on their deposits over the last week. USDC lenders on Instadap Fluid have earned 16% on their deposits over the last week. Depositors in the RD7 USDT Morpho Vault have earned 17% over the last week. And USDC lenders uh, across Moonwell, Fluid, and Arcadia have earned between 15% to 16% over the last week. Stablecoin lenders in the Ave markets tend to earn between 5% to 12% depending on utilization levels. This varies across USDC, USDT, USDS, and DAI. Yield aggregators allow you to farm with your stables too, but these vaults do all the hard work. Again, I'll highlight Toros Finance, which has several vaults across different networks that have had high yields over the last week. Looking at the perpetual delta neutral yield on optimism. So this vault uh, generates yield by taking a delta neutral position on BTC using Aave and Quentin Synthetics. So the weekly yield there has been really high. It's 79%, and the month, uh, average yield over the last month has been 40%. The Synthetics USDC Andromeda yield vaults on base. Um, again, the weekly yield there has been high at 77%, and the monthly yield has been uh, consistently high around 23%.
So this one uses the USDC to po deposit liquidity into synthetics V3 on base, and then depositors earn SNX rewards and trading fees and liquidation fees. These are all liquidated back in the USDC, and then that's used to grow the balance in the vault. Uh, Beefy Finance also has a, a lot of different options. So Beefy is a reliable protocol for farming yields across different networks. The Beefy vaults automatically harvest the yields and reinvest for rewards in the underlying yield strategy. Their USDC, USDT vault and Arbitrum, which earns yield on PancakeSwap using Beefy's concentrated liquidity manager. Uh, the current APY there is 16%. It's been, I think, consistent over the last month. And then the... Um, there's a, another vault that uses Camelot with the same pair, USDC, USDT on Arbitrum. Um, that also uses the concentrated liquidity manager and the APY there is 13%. So there's a lot of different options in the yield aggregator markets. Um, but uh, I did want to mention one more thing before I wrap up my review of on-chain yields. I want to take a, a minute to talk about Instat Fluid, which is an interesting lending protocol that shipped earlier this year. So Fluid is created by the Instadap team. Um, they created Instadap Lite and Instadap Pro. It's an interface that's made it very easy to deposit into lending markets and to do some more complicated um, leverage looping strategies. Uh, so they've been building this lending primitive for years and they shipped it earlier this year. And Fluid is a pretty innovative lending protocol. So I've been doing some research on this uh, beyond the listing that we did here at Nexus. And so Fluid allows you to create vaults where you can lend assets like USDC, USDT, ETH, and other major crypto assets. So once you create a position in your vault, you can borrow against your collateral. Um, so the way vaults are set up, it's almost like, you know, an, an isolated market a little bit. Um, and when you create a vault and you want to borrow against it, the UX in their uh, DAP is very intuitive. So if you want to supply ETH as collateral and you want to borrow USDC against your ETH, the UI is going to show you the ETH price at which your position is going to be liquidated if the price of ETH drops, uh, which is a really nice feature. Their vaults have a higher collateral factor and liquidation threshold than you know, some of the other lending protocols. And they handle liquidations differently than most other lending protocols as well because they have their own liquidity layer. Um, but... For liquidations, they handle liquidations similar to uh, Curve Llama Lend um, that uses soft liquidations. So what that means is that Fluid is only going to liquidate enough of your collateral to bring your position back below that liquidation threshold. So instead of liquidating your entire collateral balance, they're only going to liquidate enough to bring you back to a suitable health factor so you can maintain your position. Uh, the liquidation penalties on Fluid are also lower than a lot of other lending markets. So they average between 1% to 3%, depending on the different markets. Um, so they've kind of done some innovative things on the lending market side. But the big thing that they've shipped recently and they've been talking about is they have their own DEX. And so this DEX allows you to LP your collateral or your debt. So there are vaults that have smart collateral enabled or smart debt enabled. And that means that you can earn additional trading fees on top of the interest that you're earning on your collateral, or you can earn trading fees on your debt and actually offset the cost of your debt. So I still need to dig into the technical docs for Fluid's new DEX, but because they have this in-house DEX that they've built, it allows Fluid to process more efficient liquidations and then create competitive lending and borrowing markets. So they're working to integrate their DEX with major aggregators to route more volume through the Fluid DEX which is gonna increase trading fees for LPs. So, you know, if you have debt in USDC and the rate is high, but you're earning a decent amount of trading fees that offsets your debt, it's just, you know, allowing your liquidity in the lending market to be more efficient and to be earning in more places for you. So it's a pretty novel design and it's been noticed by quite a few people. So I've been pretty impressed. There's always a massive amount of innovation happening in the lending sector. And I'm really excited to see Fluid's growth and additional features so we do have Fluid Protocol Cover available for anybody who wants to deposit into Fluid while protecting against smart contract and economic risks. I'll try to highlight other interesting protocols I come across in my research on future calls, if that's something that uh, folks are interested in. But um, I just wanted to note that because I've been looking into Fluid and I, I think it's a pretty cool protocol. But I want to talk a little bit about the DeFi Pass cover launch as well. So while on-chain yields are heating up, 
I wanted to just share an update on the uh, base DeFi pass. So we launched this new product several weeks ago and we've seen consistent cover buys come through from open cover. The feedback that we've received has been overwhelmingly positive. I've had users share that it takes away the guesswork of understanding what is and isn't covered in a protocol that uses underlying protocols to generate yield. So if you're not familiar with the base DeFi pass, here's a quick TLDR. So the base DeFi pass provides protection against smart contract and economic risk across the largest protocols in the base ecosystem, including Aerodrome, Arcadia, Beefy, Compound B3, Extra Finance, Moonwell, Morpho and Morpho Vaults, Overnight Finance, and Uniswap B3. All the same protections that you get in protocol cover, but more comprehensive protection and greater flexibility. So you can move assets between all these protocols while maintaining your coverage. And it also provides the same protections for each of the underlying protocols that are used to generate yield in the list of all these protocols. So that means that you could buy a base DeFi pass, deposit into Beefy, and earn yield without worrying about whether or not the underlying yield source is covered if there's a hack in that underlying yield source. So we've designed this product to be as simple as possible for you when you're buying cover to protect your DeFi deposits. Yields in the covered protocols have been on the rise as well, with lending yields ranging from 10 to 16% in some of the lending protocols included in the base DeFi pass. Yields on beefy and other yield aggregators included in the past are also in the double digits. So there's a lot of yield opportunities on base right now. Um, and so I think this base DeFi pass has been really helpful for newer users coming on chain and some other users that just want greater flexibility when they're buying cover. So as the market takes off and yields are on the rise on base, be sure to take a look at the base DeFi pass. You can learn more about the base DeFi pass and open covers website at opencover.com. And you can see a link to the base DeFi pass highlighted in the banner. Um, but yeah, we, I think, have about 3 million in active cover on the base DeFi pass, and it's been pretty popular to start. I imagine that'll be the case as more people come across this and discover it as well. And then before I hand things over to Hugh, I just wanted to give a short update on a governance item. So I wanted to note that I'm going to be posting a governance proposal on the forum later today that outlines pricing parameter changes and added pricing functionality for fixed price public listings. So this proposal is related to some new products we have in development with one product nearing the soft launch stage. I'll be proposing that members grant the advisory board the power to reduce the global minimum price from 1% to 0.1%, uh, decrease the price bump ratio parameter from 20 to five to reduce the rate at which a listing's price increases after a large cover buy, uh, to remove the surge pricing from the protocol's existing price calculations. So this would be if utilization for a staking pool got above 90%, that price would spike. Um, we're gonna, we're looking to remove that if this is approved. Um, and then we're also looking to create functionality for public fixed price listings that any pool manager can stake against. Uh, and with this functionality to set a minimum price at the listing level, so that if we have things like the base DeFi pass or these products, that we can list it and let any staking pool manager stake against it to provide capacity, but to ensure that because it's uh, a fixed price listing that there's not a race to the bottom where people are just constantly lowering the price. So we set a price floor and then from there, staking pool managers can price that product, you know, at whatever range they would like, as long as it's at or above that floor level. All of these changes will allow us to provide users with a better cover buying experience reduce pricing for some battle-tested listings and remain competitive on certain product types like eat slashing while supporting new pro uh, product development. I'll have more information in my post that I share on the forum later today. Um, but does anybody have any questions before we move on? Okay. If not, I will turn things over to Hugh to give the foundation update. Hugh? Cool, thanks, Brave. Um, yeah, quite a few things going on um, on our side, on yeah, on the foundation side. I'll start with the the native deal, which was announced a few weeks back, um, and to just kind of give you a bit more flavor about um, how how that works and um, and kind of why why we decided to do it. So I guess the first thing is it's um, the investment's been made out of um, the Nexus Mutual Foundation, which um, is a legal entity in the in the UK, Collective Risk Services, um, and it's um it's basically the the original entity that kind of employs most most of the the developers and, and a chunk of the team um 
So why do we decide to, to make the investment? Well, the native team are a group of about eight crypto digital asset insurance specialists. They're, they've, they've been working um, mostly together as a, um, the, the main people that um, have been working together as part of Superscript previously. Um, and they're kind of a, they had a digital asset broking um, insurance broking team there and they've been very successful and kind of one of the best um, teams in in the space about building a, um, a good portfolio so what they do is they primarily um, look to get coverage for businesses that operate within the crypto sphere so that, that might be like btc miners or service companies or um, exchanges a whole bunch of other different different companies so they haven't been necessarily focused on like protocols, et cetera, but more on the businesses that operate within crypto and get them the right insurance needs from mainly traditional markets. So that's where their, their background is coming from. Um, so get them things like, you know, um, liability coverages, DNO, um, crime, all that type of usual business stuff. Um, and so they've, they've been they've been really strong there. What and what we've noticed um, in the, in those particular markets is there's not um, enough capacity to serve all the needs. Um, and so there's going to be a need to, um, or we think there's an opportunity for Nexus in particular to deploy some of its existing capital base in, into backing those types of deals. Um, and so primarily what we're looking to do is kind of um, provide, in the initial stages, provide like follow-on type coverage. So where someone wants, say, um, 30 million of coverage and the traditional markets can only source them, say, 10 or 15, then maybe Nexus could come in and, and fill out the rest um on on similar terms and so um what, what we've done here is like it's really a partnership to grow out the distribution of of the mutual um and so i'm pretty really pretty excited about this i've known the team for quite a while um been kind of talking for for many years i guess um but the time the time was right when they decided to kind of spin out and set up their own their own venture and, and we're i'm very i'm very happy to kind of back them um so They've they've launched. They've got all their licenses in place to sell um, insurance, um, regulated insurance business. Um, but they're looking to also partner and create um, opportunities for on-chain risk. Um, and you would have seen that they've actually created a staking pool on Nexus. Um, so they're kind of re getting ready to go, and they're they're building up their um, pipeline of customers and stuff. Um, just post post launch a few weeks ago. So um, hopefully we can see some really good things come. Um, from native in in 2025, so I'm kind of really excited about this partnership. But um, I guess we it'll takes a little while to wind up. So expecting some some more of the traction to happen in 2025. Um, so that's that's been pretty cool. I think um, more specifically on, on the Nexus side of things, I guess the um, you know like Trump winning um, a few weeks back has definitely changed things. I think the one thing from my perspective is apart from seeing a lot more just general inbound and questions is that the uncertainty on regulations that has been plaguing the industry for quite a while now, um, it's definitely been holding um, people back. It's been keeping traditional capital on the sidelines. It's, um, it's definitely, it's created all these questions. And people say, like, you know, it's, it's not the right time for us, et cetera. We just wait and see what happens. And a lot, that's that's obviously the, the tide seemed to be changing now. And, and you know, that there's a, given the, um, a, I guess, a more positive outlook from the US, um, other um, countries often tend to follow um, the US on regulation like this. So um, so generally people are much more willing to have those conversations. They're actively reaching out. Um, doesn't mean things are going to change immediately. Don't know. But, um, you know, I think um, I think the direction of travel is, is very positive and a lot of conversations and potential deals are op open to happening than, than before when it was kind of like, no, we just want to definitely stay away. But that's a bad that type of stuff. So, um, so a positive, just general um, a feeling in the market, and um, and feel like there's going to be good opportunities coming um, out of this over the over the next year. So yeah, well, um, from the kind of team side, we had a um, a full team get together in um, in Paris a few weeks back, um, and the main kind of thing there was obviously just get together as a team, sync on a whole bunch of stuff. We're a kind of global a global team, so it's um always good to get in meet everyone in person. But basically, ironing out the medium term road roadmap about what we're doing, um, and so we, we I want to share more uh, on this in terms of specifics. But um, you would have heard Brave talk about um, a bunch of smaller protocol enhancements, especially around pricing. So um, they're kind of smaller tweaks, but that we think we can shoot quite quickly. 
um, that we think can also make a, a decent difference, especially as yields start increasing um, within DeFi. And so the demand for cover should um, also increase. We've seen that every, every single time. So um, we want to be in the best position we can be. Um, I think more generally, we're actually in a really good position with the, the fundamentals of the protocol there. Um, it's just about getting out, um, increasing the distribution and um, and seeing and getting the yields up and seeing, uh, seeing the yields rise and then obviously um, getting the cover to back that. Um, so sorry, that's a bit of a tangent, but um, getting back onto the, the get together um, and the roadmap. So I guess some bigger chunk of pieces of work are around L2s, there's also governance, um, revamp, et cetera. But, um, and there's also some um, some new product launches that um, we'll look to share more, more broadly as um, soon as well. So I think a lot of interesting stuff. We're looking to give you more insight on that once we just get it in a nice shareable form. Um, but it was really good to sync on the team. There's a lot of energy coming up um, off the back of that um, get together and um, there's a lot of momentum. So um, I think with the markets, team's in a good spot. I think the team's in a great spot, um, probably the best spot we've ever been in, to be honest. Um, and so I think we're really, really well positioned more generally, um, especially with the yield environment and, the, and I guess the more positive um, kind of bull market happening. So yeah, excited about that. Um, also probably worth just just noting, we're gonna do a bit more of a um, wider announcement on this, but you may have seen that like CB, BTC is now um, live as a cover purchase asset. Um, on the on the protocol, which is pretty cool. Um, I think the um, one of the really interesting things here is that the the whole BTC staking restaking type um, market. We think that that's going to be a decent. Um, there's decent opportunities there. Um, there's also um, and this kind of goes back to the native stuff. There are also a lot of potential um, a lot of potential users that want to buy cover in BTC. So um, BTC miners being a particular one that struggled to get BTC denominated coverage from traditional insurance. So it's basically not available. Um, so coming to um, to Nexus to purchase BTC denominated cover is, um, is pretty big, um, especially when we can do it at, at decent sizes that are meaningful to them. Also exchanges often tend to want to buy some of their coverage in, in BTC terms. So um, so that's interesting um, as, as well. So uh, I think there's, um, it's useful for both the um, people looking to um, earn yield on BTC, but also, um, I guess, more broadly um, for the kind of more um, traditional businesses within the crypto space. So yeah, um, keep keep an eye on that and and have a look at the opportunities on BTC with the restaking. Who knows where it's going to go exactly, but um, there seems to be a lot of effort being put in the wider industry on it. So that's probably something to, to keep an eye on um, for the future. Um, yeah, that's... It's a lot of stuff, but um, but yeah, pretty excited just in general with where we're at, and um, I guess looking forward to the the coming weeks and months and see where this um, where the market goes. So um, yeah, happy to take happy to take questions on on any or all of that. Thank you, Hugh. Thank you, Brave. If there are no questions at this time, I'd like to continue with the last week in numbers and then talk about the new community dashboard and transparency at Nexus Mutual. Last week, the Mutual sold $12.5 million in cover and members earned $46.6 thousand dollars in fees with significant cover purchases for Pendle, Hyperliquid Protocols and Morpho Vault. In the second week of November, the mutual sold $36.7 million in cover and members earned $141.4 thousand in fees. That week, the retail mutual renewed their coverage with over $11 million and $16 million purchased for the Eigenlayer plus EtherFi bundle and Aave V3 respectively. For more details, please check out the community dashboard at dune.com slash nexus underscore mutual slash community. And with that, let's move on to the next item on our agenda. I'm very happy to bring you some exciting news. Our brand new community dashboard is now live. Over the past few weeks, we've been working closely with our very own Dune wizard, Tomaj, to create a tool that offers you visibility into the Nexus Mutual ecosystem. 
This dashboard is packed with insights providing in-depth weekly, monthly, and quarterly analysis on cover sales, premiums earned, and staking rewards accumulated. But that's just scratching the surface. Um, the dashboard also reveals fascinating connections between market dynamics and cover purchase trends, offering a whole new layer of insight into our community's interactions with Nexus Mutual. Dive in and explore it yourself at Nexus Mutual's Dune Analytics profile. With the launch of this dashboard, we're taking things up a notch and it will now replace the more basic weekly analysis I've been posting on the Nexus Mutual Governance Forum. The goal here is accessibility and clarity, giving members direct access to the numbers that matter the most to our community. As always, Tomas and I would love to hear your thoughts. Please let us know if you have any feedback or ideas for making this tool even more user-friendly. You can reach out to me on Discord or here on X. This leads me into a topic that is deeply connected to this, to this launch and part of our Nexus Mutual 101 series, which we hold at the end of the DeFi Pools bi-weekly calls to get you a little more acquainted with how we run Nexus Mutual with all our members. Today, I want to shine a spotlight on our ongoing commitment to transparency. It's at the heart of Nexus Mutual's operations and the new community dashboard is just one of the many ways we're working to keep our operations open and accessible to every member of the Nexus Mutual community. Since 2019, the team at Nexus Mutual has been committed to creating a truly open, welcoming space, whether you are a user seeking protection measures in DeFi or a builder looking to explore partnership potential in our risk sharing ecosystem, our doors are always open. The community team works hand in hand with marketing product and other core groups to champion transparency at every level of Nexus Mutual. If you are new to our ecosystem, here are some of the key channels where the most vital conversations unfold. First and foremost, the Nexus Mutual Governance Forum, accessible at forum.nexusmutual.io is where you can track the entire journey of major product investment and claims discussions, as well as find critical project updates. This space is alive at conversations and it's a place for you to contribute to if you've got an idea or an issue that needs detailed input from the community. The forum is the perfect stage to propose it and to spark meaningful dialogue. If you have a simple question, or are looking for a fast response, join our Discord. Second, our data dashboard stack on Dune Analytics offers a unique in-depth view of the Nexus Mutual ecosystem. From the intricacies of the capital pool to tokenomics and staking insights, these dashboards reveal the essential building blocks of the protocol. Combined with the Nexus Mutual documentation found at docs, Dot .nexusmutual.io. These tools are a treasure trove for the data enthusiasts among us, providing a first-hand look at how we operate and make decisions. Last but certainly not least, our community calls and soon webinars remain a vital part of our connection with members. These sessions give you direct access to both the foundation and DAO teams. Alongside marketing, we're working to make these calls even more engaging with well-defined teams, accessible content, and interesting discussions that resonate with our community. Our commitment to transparency and openness remains at the heart of Nexus Mutual. We are dedicated to bringing more teams and creators into our ecosystem empowered through initiatives like the grants program, and the accelerator program. These programs are designed to support new ideas and fresh collaborations, fueling growth across the community. To learn more about how you can be part of this journey, visit nexusmutualdao.io. And as always, we'd love to hear from you.
If there are other ways we can enhance accessibility, openness, or community connection, let us know. Together, we are building a welcoming, dynamic future for Nexus Mutual. And that was it, everybody. Thanks for joining today's call and for being a part of our community. As a thank you, we've got a poll app for you. Just DM me. I am Sam to run on Discord, and I will send over the mint link. We also have a new intro channel on Discord to get to know each other better. Drop a few words about yourself. You will earn another poll app. Your support keeps us moving forward. Stay safe out there in DeFi and see you on the next call. Have a great week. Bye. Thanks, everyone. everyone.